I mostly read public domain books here on Glenn Reads Books to you, and they were written a long time ago, so they're usually racist or sexist or bigoted. But in there somewhere is a story, and uh, that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist. But they might have uh, adult language or adult situations, like, uh, oh, I don't know, making sex. Uh, so that's your warning. But I'm sure you're grown up enough to handle it. Uh, don't write to me complaining. Oh, oh, oh Autumn. The weather is cool, and the mice are invading. Oh, son of a... You can't just keep coming over here. Listen, look at you just sitting, sitting down, getting yourself all comfortable in my chair of my house, uninvited, to have me read stories to you. Well, uh, welcome to the Glenn Reads Books to You Mansion. It's a fun little bit where I pretend to live in a mansion and not just recording in my basement. Uh, this is where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories. Uh, this week... Uh, we're going to start reading The Legend of the Seventh Virgin, which I thought would be kind of fun. A uh, little burp, pre-October-ish, uh, uh, scary romance books by Victoria Holt. Uh, you want to hear about the author? Sure. It's not Victoria Holt. It's Eleanor Alice Hibbert, who was born September 1st, 1906, and died January 18th, 1993. She was an uh, English writer of historical romances. Uh, she published several books uh, a year in different literary genres, each genre under a different pen name. For example, Jean Plady for fictionalized history of European royalty. That sounds boring. Victoria Holt for gothic romances. And uh, Philippa, Philippia, Philippa Carr for multi-generational family saga, which also sounds really boring. Uh, she also wrote light romances, crime novels, murder mysteries, and uh, thrillers under pseudonyms, such as uh, <clears throat> Eleanor Buford, Elber Ford, that's a really weird name, Kathleen Killo, Anna Parsival, and Ilias, Ilias, Ilias Tate. Uh, you want some fun facts? Sure you do. You seem inquisitive. Uh, during the 1930s, Hibbert wrote nine novels, each about 150,000 words in length, all of them uh, serious psychological studies of contemporary life. However, none of these were accepted for publication. At the same time, uh, she wrote short stories for newspapers such as the Daily Mail, uh, Evening News, and also appeared in The Star and Women's Realm and Ladies' Home Journal. The turning point came when fiction editor of the Daily Mail told her, Hey, uh, hey, you're barking up the wrong tree. You must write something which is sellable. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is romantic fiction. Hibbert decided then to read 50 romance novels as research and then published her first fiction book, Daughter of Anna, in 1941. Uh, it was a, a period novel set in Australia in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, it was a moderate success, and Hibbert received 30 pounds as advance for it. Eh? How do you live off that? I have no idea. Even back then, I, I guess 30 pounds is like five fifty thousand dollars Eleanor spent three months out of the year traveling the world on a cruise ship uh, to get away from the cold uh, winters in London. Uh, so uh, when she died on the 18th, uh, it was on the cruise ship The Sea Princess. Uh, it was somewhere between Greece and Egypt. And then, as uh, a hero at sea will be uh, will do, uh, they buried her at sea. Uh, oh, thank God for the grandfather clock telling me to shut up and uh, get us down to the library where we can read this book. Well, there you are. Why don't you get yourself all settled? Uh, you know, go ahead and sit in that naga hide chair and uh, and uh, cozy up. It's it's autumn. Uh, it's getting a little little nippy out. Eh? Uh, if you if you're feeling kind of cold, go ahead and grab that blanket. Uh, that afghan, that dusty afghan that smells like cigarettes. Uh, screw off. Don't say anything about it. I'm going through some stuff. Uh, let's begin the legend of the seventh virgin. Which, by the way, I never read this ahead of time. I just read it as I'm recording, and um, I. 
normally only skim the book just to find out how many chapters I want to read in an episode. It turns out I found out as I was skimming and skimming and skimming and skimming. This book has no chapters. It's 400 pages with not a single goddamn chapter in it. I am hope it doesn't just all take place in one room where no one ever leaves. How do you designate that you've changed a scene? Like, to a different part of the house? Or... All right, let's get started. <clears throat> Two days after the uh, bones of the walled-up nun uh, were found in Lamston Abbas, uh, the five of us were together. Oh, there were Justin and Johnny St. Lamston, uh, Meliora Martin, Dick Kimber, uh, and myself, Karen Sakarly. Karen Sa... K... E-R-E-N-S-A. Karen's, uh... These names. Uh, Villith, as grand a name as any of them. For all that I have lived in Cobb Walled Cottage, and they were the gentry. The abbess had belonged to the St. Lamstons for centuries. And before they had owned it, oh, it had been a covenant, uh, or convent, whatever. Impressive, but naturally built of Cornish stone. Its battled in towers were pure Norman, and had been restored here and there, and one wing was obviously Tudor. Yeah, this is a history nerd. I have never been inside the house uh, at the time, but I knew the surrounding district very well, and it was not the house which was unique for, interesting as it was, there were many more in England, even in Cornwall, as interesting as it was antiquated. Oh, it was uh, the six virgins who made St. Lampston Abbas different from all the others. Oh, the six virgins was the name by which the stones were known. Eh? And if the legend could be believed, they were misnamed because according to that, uh, there were six women who precisely because they had ceased to be virgins had been turned into stone. Miriora's father and a Reverend Charles Martin, whose hobby was delivering into the past, called them the men here's dash quote men being a Cornish word for the for stone and her for long. The story about there having been seven virgins came from the Reverend Charles, too. Oh, his great-grandfather uh, had had. I hate it when people do that in books. The word had twice in a row. His great father had had the same hobby. Uh, then one day, Reverend Charles found some notes which had been tucked away in an old trunk, and among those was the story of the seventh virgin. Uh, he had had, honestly, again, it imprinted in the local paper. It had made uh, quite a stir in St. Lampstead. Oh, and people who before had never bothered to glance at the stones, oh, went to, went to stare at them. The story was that the six novices and a nun had ceased to be virgins, and the novices were driven from the covenant. Oh, and, then they, and as they left, they danced in the nearby meadow to show their defiance, and because of this, they were turned into stones. Oh, in those days, it was believed that good luck was brought upon a place if a living person was what they called, uh, <clears throat> quote unquote, walled up, which meant putting that person into a space in the wall in the building around her, uh, leaving her to die. This is good luck. It was believed to be good luck was brought to a place if a living person was walled up. This is amazing. The nun, having sinned more deeply than the others, was contem uh, condemned to be walled up. The Reverend Charles said the story was nonsense. And the stones must have been uh, in the meadow years before the, the covenant convent. Why do you keep wanting to say covenant all the time? Something's wrong with me. I think I'm having like a, a book stroke. Uh, was built for, according to him, oh, oh, they were older than Christianity. He pointed out that there were similar ones all over Cornwall. And at Stonehenge. Eh? But people at St. Lamston liked the story of the virgins best. So that's the one they made up their minds to believe. They had been believing it for some time when one of the oldest of the Abbas walls collapsed and Sir Justin St. Lamston ordered that it should be immediately repaired. Reuben Pengaster, ugh, this whole book going to be full of names like this, was working on the spot at the moment when the hollowed wall was exposed and he swore he saw a woman standing there. Oh, uh, she was there one second, he insisted. Like a, like a nightmare she were. Uh, and then she were gone and there was nothing but uh, dust. Yeah. And they old bones. Some said that it was the start of Reuben being what was uh, called in Cornwall Pisky Mazed. Uh, but he wasn't mad and he wasn't quite like other people. Uh, he was slightly different from the rest of us, though it was said. Uh, he'd been caught by the Piskies uh, one dark night. And having become Pisky Mazed, uh, he had stayed like that. He looked on uh, what weren't intended for human eyes, they said. It made him Pisky Mazed. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but there were bones in the wall, and it was said the experts that they had belonged to a young woman. Uh, there was fresh interest in the abbess, just as there had been when the Reverend Charles had had uh, his, in his piece printed in the paper about his men here's. People wanted uh, to see the spot where the bones had been found, and I was one who wanted to see. Oh, 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 the day was hot when I left the college soon after midday. We had had, I'm getting so tired of this, it's like the fifth time, a bowl of quillette each, Joe, Granny B, and myself. For anyone not Cornish who doesn't know what a quillette is, eh, it's peas made to a sort of porridge. Sounds disgusting. It was used a great deal in Cornwall during the hungry times because it was cheap and sustaining. Of course, uh, they wouldn't have quillette at the Abbas. Uh, I was thinking as I went along, uh, but they would be eating roast pheasant off gold plates. Oh, they'd be drinking wine out of silver tankards. Oh, I knew very little of how uh, quality ate, but my imagination was vivid. And I could clearly see the picture of St. Lampstons at their table. Oh, in those days, I was continually comparing my life to theirs, and the comparison angered me. Well, I was... Yeah, 12 years old, black-haired and black-eyed. Uh, and although I was very thin, uh, there was something about me which was already causing men to look twice at me. Oh, are you bragging? Is she bragging? I did not know uh, very much about myself, uh, not that time, and she's being given self-analysis, but there was one characteristic of which I was aware even then. I was proud. Yeah, yeah, and with that sort of pride, which uh, one of the de seven deadly sins, oh, I walked in a bold and haughty way, as though I wasn't one of the cottage people, but belonged to a family like the St. Larnstons. Our cottage stood apart from, from the others in a small copse, uh, and I felt uh, that that made us apart, although ours was exactly the same as the others. Uh, it was merely a rectangle uh, with, with walls of whitewashed cob and a thatched roof, about as primitive as a dwelling could be. Still, I was constantly assuring myself ours was different, just as we were different. Everyone would admit that Granny B was different, and so was I with my pride. As for Joe, eh, whether he liked it or not, he, he's going to be different. Too. I was determined to see to that. Oh, I ran out of our cottage, past the church, in the doctor's house, through the uh, through the kissing gate, eh, and then across the field, which was uh, a shortcut to the Abbas Drive. The drive was three quarters of a mile long, and there were lodge gates at the end. But coming this way and scrambling through the hedge, I struck the drive close to where it opened and to the lawns which stood in front of the house. I paused... Looking about me and listening to the rustle of insects in the long grass of the meadow, and some distance away I could see the roof of the Dower House where Dick Kimber lived, and briefly I envied him for a living in such a fine house. Oh, I felt my heartbeats, my heartbeats, like more than one heart beating, quicken, because very soon I should be on a forbidden ground, a trespasser. And Sir Justin was hard on trespassers, particularly in these woods. Oh, I'm only I'm only twelve, I said to myself, and eh, it couldn't do much to a child. Couldn't they? Jack Toms had been caught with a pheasant in his pocket. Oh, and it had been transportation for him seven long years in Botany Bay. Now oh, he was still serving them. And he had been 11, thank God just one had, when uh, he was caught. But I was not interested in pheasants. Oh, I was doing no harm. And they said Sir Justin was more lenient with girls than boys. Now, uh, I could see the house uh, through the trees, and I stood still, disturbed by my unaccountable emotion. It was a, a grand sight, with its Norman towers and its mu munitioned windows. Uh, something's going on with this uh, e-book where words are getting screwed up, so M-U, then capital U, I-O-N-E-D. Mun munitioned when I don't know. Uh, so something happened in the translation of this book. Uh, the stone carvings were more impressive, it seemed to me, because after hundreds of years, the noses of griffins and dragons had become blunted. The lawn sloped gently down the gravel path around the house. Oh, this was this was an exciting view because on uh, one side, uh, the lawn divided only by a box hedge uh, from the meadow in which the six virgins uh, seen from a distance. They did look like young women. Eh? I can only imagine how they would appear at night. Hey, 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 it's starlight or, or, or by the light of the, of the crescent moon. Oh, and I, I made up my mind to come and look at them one night and close by the virgins incongruously. Uh, it was the old tin mine. Perhaps 
It was the mind which made this such a startling sight, for the old balance box and beam winding engine were still there, and no one could go right up to the shaft and look down to the darkness below. Why, uh, it had been asked, uh, did the St. Leinstons not have all the evidence uh, that there had once been a mine there removed? Uh, uh, what purpose did it serve? <laughs> It was unsightly and uh, something like sacrilege to leave it there besides legendary stones. But uh, there was a reason. One of the St. Lawrence's had gambled so heavily that he'd become almost bankrupt. And he would have to have been forced to sell the abbess if uh, Tin had not been recovered to his estate. So the, so the mine was worked, although the St. Lawrence's had hated the fact that it had to be within sight of their mansion. And down into the earth the tinners had burrowed, working with their crooks and pokers, picking out the tin which was to save the abbess for the family. But once the house was saved, the St. Larnstons, hating the mine, had closed it. There had been hardship in the district, so Granny told me, uh, when the mine was closed, but Sir Justin didn't mind that. Uh, he didn't care about other people. He was all for himself. Granny B said that the Larnstons had left the mine as he was to remind the family of the rich tin underground to which they could turn in times of need. The Cornish, nah, they're a superstitious race, uh, 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 the rich, no less than the poor. And I believe that the St. Larnstons looked on the mine as a symbol of prosperity. While there was a tin in their land, they were safe from financial disaster, and there was a, a rumor in existence. The mine was nothing but old scat bal, uh, a disused mine. And some of the old men that they remembered, their fathers saying that the load was running out and it closed. The rumor persisted that the St. Larnstons had known this and had closed down the mine because it had nothing more to offer. But they liked to be uh, thought richer than they were, for in Cornwall, tin and money. Whatever the reason, eh, Sir Justin did not wish the mine to be worked, and that was the end of it. He was a man both hated and feared in the country. On the occasions when I had seen him riding on his great white horse, or striding along with a gun on his shoulder, I had thought of him as a kind of, kind of an ogre. Oh, I had heard tales about him from Granny Bee. And I knew he considered that everything in St. Lamston belonged to him, uh, which might have some truth to it, but he also believed that the people of St. Lamston belonged to him, too. And that was a different matter. And although he dared not practice the old uh, synagogue rites, he had reduced the number of girls. Uh, Granny B was always warning me to keep out of his way. And I turned into that meadow and I could, I could go so close to the sixth version. I paused beside them and, and leaned against one of them. Um, they were arranged low in a circle, uh, looking exactly as though they had been caught swaying in a dance. Oh, there are various heights, just as six women should be. Uh, two who were very tall and others were the sizes of fully grown women standing there in the stillness of a hot afternoon. Oh, and I, I could believe that I was one of those poor virgins. Oh, I could well imagine that I should have been as sinful and uh, having sinned as found out that I should have danced my defiance on the grass. I touched the cold stone gently, and I could have deceived myself quite easily that one of them bent toward me as though she recognized my sympathy and the bond between us. Eh, crazy thoughts I had. Eh? It was because I was Granny B's granddaughter. Now was the dangerous part. I had to run across the lawns where I might be seen from one of the windows. Uh, I seemed to fly through the air until I was so close to the gray walls of the house that I knew uh, where to find the wall. I knew, too, that the workmen would be sitting in a field some distance from the house eating their hunks of bread, all brown and crusty, baked that morning on the open hearth. We called them mansions in these parts. Perhaps a... And perhaps they should have uh, a little cheese and some pilchards, or if they were lucky, a pasty, eh, which they would have brought from home wrapped in their red handkerchiefs. Making my way cautiously round the house, I came to a small gate leading into a walled garden. And on these walls, peaches grew. Oh, there were roses too, eh? and the smell was wonderful. This was trespassing proper. But I was determined to, see, uh, determined to see where those bones had been found. And on the far side, propped against a wall, was a wheelbarrow, uh, where the bricks on the ground were the workmen's tools, and so I knew I was at the right place. Oh, I ran over and peered through the hole in the wall. Inside it was hollow, like a, like a, like a little chamber, about seven feet high and six feet wide. 
It is clear that the thick old wall had been deliberately left hollow, and studying it, I was certain that the story of the Seventh Virgin was a true one. I longed to stand in the spot where the girl had stood, and to know what it felt like to be shut in, so I scrambled through the hole, grazing my knee as I did so for some three feet from the ground, and once inside the wall, I moved away from the hole, turning my back to the light, and tried to imagine what it must have felt like when they forced her to stand where I was standing now, knowing that they were going to wall her up and leave her for the remaining remainder of her short life in utter darkness. Oh, I could burp, understand her horror and despair. There was a smell of decay about me, a smell of death. And I told myself, and so strong was my imagination that in those seconds I really believed I was the seventh virgin. Oh, that I had extravagantly cast away my chastity. It was doomed to a frightful death. I was saying to myself, I, I would do it again. And I should have been too proud to show my terror. And I hoped she, too, had been, for although pride was a sin, it was a solace. It prevented your demeaning yourself. I was brought back to my own century by the sound of voices. I do want to see it. Oh, I knew that voice. It belonged to Meliora Martin, uh, the parson's daughter, and I despised despised her for her neat gingham dresses, which were never dirty, and her long white stocking and her shiny black shiny shoes with straps and, and, and buckles. And I, I couldn't have liked to possess shoes like that, but oh, because I couldn't, I deluded myself into the belief that, oh, I despise them. She was 12 years old. The same age that I was, and I had seen her, one of the parsonage windows, bent over a book sitting in the garden under the lime tree, uh, with her governess reading aloud or sewing. Uh, poor prisoner, I said then, and I was angry because at the time I wanted more than anything in the world to be able to read and write. Uh, I, uh, I had a notion that it was the ability to read and write more than the fine clothes and manners that made people equal to one another. Her hair uh, was what some would call gold. <laughs> which I called pfft, yellow. Her eyes were blue and big, uh, her skin white and delicately tinted. Uh, I called her Melly eh, to myself, just to rob her of a little dignity. Meliora, it sounded so pretty when people said it, does it? It sounds horrible. But my name was just as interesting. Karensa, the Cornish for peace and love. Granny B told me, and I have never heard that Meliora meant anything. Uh, you make yourself dirty, that was Johnny St. Lamson speaking. Now I shall be found out, I thought, and by a St. Lamston. But it was only Johnny who, it was said, uh, would like to be his father in one respect and one respect only, was that as far as women were concerned, Johnny was 14. I had seen him sometimes with uh, his father, a gun on his shoulder, because all the St. Lamstons were brought up to hunt and shoot. Johnny was not much taller than I, for... I was tall for my age, but he was fair, although not as fair as Meliora. And he didn't uh, look like a St. Lawrenceton. I was glad it was only Johnny and Meliora. Uh, I shan't mind Johnny. Do you really believe the story? Yeah, of course. Uh, that poor woman to be shut up alive. Uh, hello, a different voice this. Uh, two children come away from the wall. Uh, they were... We are looking to see uh, we, where they found the nun, said Johnny. Oh, nonsense. There's absolutely no evidence that it was a nun. It's just a legend. I crouched as far from the hole as I could while I wandered. Oh, I wondered whether I ought to dart out and run. I remembered that it would be easy to scramble out of the hole and that they would almost certainly catch me, particularly now that the others had come. Meliora was looking in through the hole and was. Uh, it took a second or so for her eyes to become adjusted in the dimness. And then she gasped. I was certain that in those few seconds, she thought I was the ghost of the seventh virgin. Why, eh, she began, she... Johnny's head came through, and there was a brief silence. Then he murmured, ah, it's only one of the cottage children. Uh, be careful there, it might not be safe. I knew the voice now. It belonged to Justin St. Lamston, heir to the estate, no longer a boy, but a man. Home from the university on the Vatican. Uh, but I tell you, there's someone in there, Johnny replied. Uh, don't tell me the lady's still there, yet in the voice of one I knew as Dick Kimber, who lived in the Dower House. It was Oxford with the young Justin. Uh, come and see for yourself, it's called Johnny. I was crouching closer to the wall, and I didn't know uh, what I hated most. The fact that I was caught, or by the way they looked at me, one of those cottage children. How dare he? 
Another face, he's looking in on me. He's brown and covered in untidy dark hair, and those brown eyes were laughing. Not the virgin, commented Dick Kimber. Hey, does she look like you, Kim? said Johnny. Now Justin pushed them aside to look in. He was very tall and thin. His eyes were serene and his voice calm. Who is it? he replied. It's not an it, I replied. Uh, it's Miss Karen Sakarli. Uh, you are a child from the cottages, she said, or he said. You have no right to be here, uh, but come out now. Well, I hesitated, not knowing uh, what he intended to do. I pictured him taking me to the house and accusing me of trespassing, although I did not want to stand before him in the scanty Holland smock, which had become too small for me. My feet were well-shaped, though, uh, but I had no shoes, and they would be grimy. I washed them in the stream every night because I was very anxious to keep myself as clean as gentry, but having no shoes to protect them, oh, they were always dirty by the end of the day. What's the matter? demanded Dick Kimber, whom they called Kim. (sighs) And I could always think of him as Kim in the future. Why don't you come out? Go away, I retorted, and I will. He was about to step into the hollow when Justin warned, "Ah, Careful, Kim. You might bring the entire wall down. And Kim remained where he was. Uh, What did you say your name was? Karen Sakarli. Yeah, very grand. You better come out. Go away. Uh, Ding, ding, bell, sang Johnny. Karen's is in the well. (laughs) That's fun. That's fun. Uh, Who put her in? Continued Kim. Uh, Was it due to sin? Oh, this is a good time. This is fun. Oh, they were laughing at me. And as I stepped out of the hole, preparing to run, they made a circle round me. And in half a second, I thought the circle of stones, and it was uncanny feeling as uh, which I had experienced in the wall. Oh, that seems as good a place as any uh, to take a break. And instead of learning more about this wildly confusing book, why don't we go uh, learn about the newest upcoming books from Penguin Random House? Uh, why don't we do that? Eh, oh, I don't know, in the closet. Why the closet? I'm running out of places to do my bits, and so I don't want to do it all in the same room all the time. So why don't we go to the closet, and I'll bring my guitar, and I will uh, whisper to you uh, a new upcoming book that'll be so exciting for you to look forward to buying. Oh, there you are. I knew you were going to come into the closet. Get in here. Can you hear the guitar I'm playing just for you? Of course you can. I'm going to tell you about a new book from Penguin Random House called Smolder by Laurel K. Hamilton. It's a bestseller. Uh, You want to learn more about it? Yeah, of course you do. Uh, Vampire Hunter, uh, Anita Blake, is no stranger to killing monsters. Uh, It's part of her job as a preternatural U.S. Marshal. After all, but... But even her experience isn't enough to stop something that is bent on destroying everything and everyone she loves. Anita Blake is engaged to Jean-Claude, the new vampire king of America. All humans think he's gone over the side of the monsters, but vampires fear their new king has fallen under the spell of the most powerful necromancer in a thousand years. Oh, and in the the midst of wedding preparations, including getting Edward, a.k.a. U.S. Marshal Ted Forrester, this is just so confusing, fitted as best man Anita... Burp gets a call that the local police need her expertise at a brutal murder scene linked to a nationwide manslaughter of burp, vampires, and humans dubbed the Sunshine Murders. But there is more than just a murder to catch. Oh, oh, an ancient evil has arrived. In Saint, this is just a slew of... They're just slapping everything in here. Uh, St. Louis has to challenge Jean-Claude for his crown, his life, Anita, and all they hold dear. Even with Jean-Claude's new powers as king and Anita's necromancy, it isn't enough. They must embrace their triumvirate and allow primeval darkness uh, to spread across the country, possessing the first vampires and then the humans. Evil will triumph unless Jean-Claude and Anita can prove that love conquers all. That is just a giant pot filled with everything you can slap in there. Uh, That's called Smolder from Laurel K. Hamilton. It's hardcover for 28 bucks. Coming out March 1st, uh, 2023. That's the past. That already came out. This is supposed to be a new book. Well, whatever. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Bookshop.org, Hudson Booksellers, IndieBound, Powell's Target, and you know they made it when they're finally on the shelves of Walmart. Well, that was depressing. Uh, why don't we go back into the library and continue reading this book?
Oh, look at that. You finally got out of the closet. Took you a while. Why don't you take a seat, uh, and I'll keep reading. Oh, they must have been noticing the difference between us. My hair was so black that it had a blue sheen to it. My eye, like a bug. My eyes were big and they looked enormous in my small face. My skin was smooth and olive. And they were so neat and civilized, all of them, even Kim with his untidy hair and his laughing eyes. Meliora's blue ones were troubled. And in that moment, I knew that I had underrated her. She was soft. But she wasn't silly. She was far better than the others did. Oh, oh, how I felt. There's nothing to be afraid of, Karen, sir. I hate that name, she said. Oh, is it there? Contradicted Johnny. Uh, Miss Karen Sakarly is guilty of trespassing. She's been caught in the act. We must think up a punishment for her. Well, he was teasing, of course. He was going to hurt me, but he had noticed my long black hair. And I saw his eyes on the bare skin of my shoulder where it showed through my torn smock. Kim said, it isn't only cats who die of curiosity. Well, do be careful, ordered Justin. He turned to me. You've been very silly. Don't you know that scrambling about a wall that's just collapsed could be dangerous? Moreover, what are you doing here? Oh, we didn't wait, we didn't wait for an answer. Now get out. The faster, the better. Oh, 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 I hated them all. Justin for his coldness and talking to me as though I was no different from the people who had lived in the cottages of his father's estates. Johnny and Kim eh, for their teasing and Meliora because she knew how I felt and was sorry for me. Oh, I ran, but when I came to the door of the walled garden and was a safe distance from them, I stopped and looked back at them. Oh, they were still standing in a semicircle watching me. Mariola, uh, Mer Meliora was the one that I had to stare at. Oh, she looked so concerned, and her concern was for me. I put out my tongue. I heard Johnny and Kim laughing, and then I turned my back at them and sped away. Granny B was sitting outside the cottage when I reached home. She often sat in the sun, her stool propped up against the wall, her pipe in her mouth, her eyes half closed as she, as she smiled to herself. Then I threw myself down beside her and told her what happened. Well, she rested her hand on my head as I talked. As she'd like to stroke my hair, which was like her own. For although she was an old woman, her hair was thick and black. Oh, she took good care of it. Oh, sometimes wearing it in two thick plates. Uh, at others, piling in high coils. People said it was a natural for a woman of her age to have hair like that. But Granny B liked them to say it. Oh, she was proud of her hair, yes. But it was more than that. It was a symbol, like Samson's. <laughs> he used to tell her that she would laugh. And I knew that she brewed special preparation, which she brushed in every night so it would sit for five minutes massaging her head. No one knew uh, what she did except Joe and me. And Joe eh, didn't notice. He's always too busy with some bird or animal. But but I, I was sitting and watch her do her hair. And she used to say to me, Oh, I'll tell you how to keep your hair, Karen, sir, uh, when you'll have a head of hair like mine till the day you die. Uh, but she didn't. She, she hadn't told me yet. All in good time, she added. She's not going to live very long. And if I were to uh, be took sudden, oh, she's already talking about it, you'll find the recipe in the corner cupboard. Well, then just go look at the corner cupboard. Granny B loved Joe and me. Oh, it is a wonderful thing to be loved by her. But what was more wonderful still was to know that I was the first with her always. Yeah, Joe was uh, like a little pet. Eh. Oh, oh, I loved him in a protective sort of way. But between Granny and me, there was a closeness, which we both knew and were glad of. She was a... Uh, oh, wow, it's all gobbledygook because the book's all screwed up. A vast woman. A... A wise? We're going to say it's probably the word wise. She was a wise woman. I don't mean merely that she had good sense, but she was known for miles round for her special powers, and people of all sorts came to see her. Uh, she could uh, cure them of the ailments, and she trusted them more than they did the doctor. Uh, the cottage was filled with smells that changed from day to day, and according to the remedies which are being brewed, I... I was learning what herbs to gather in the woods and fields and what they should cure. She was also believed to have special powers, which enabled her to see into the future. And I asked her to teach me, too. But she said it was uh, something that you taught by yourself by keeping your eyes and your ears open and learning about people. For human nature was the same all the world over. There was so much bad uh, in the good and so much good in the bad. That it was all a matter of weighing up how much good or bad had been allotted to each one. And if you know your people uh, could make a good guess as to how they would act, and that was seeing into the future. Uh, when you 
became clever at it. Oh, oh, people believed you, and they'd often act the way you told them to, just to help you along. We, uh, we lived on Granny's wisdom, and we didn't do badly. Uh, when someone, uh, killed a pig, uh, there'd be a good joint for us, often some grateful, uh, client would... Uh, put a sack of potatoes or peas on our doorstep and there would be a hot baked bread and I was good at managing too. I could cook well and I could bake our bread and pastries and turn out a fine pie of tadish or squab. These are words. Again, England with their words. It's just, everything's so cute. It's like baby's words. And I had been happier since Joe that I had come to Granny than I was before. The best thing of all was the bond between us and I felt it now as I sat be- beside her at the cottage door. They mocked me, I said. The St. Lawrenstons and Kim. Uh, Meliora did, though. Uh, she was uh, sorry for me. Granny said, uh, if you could make a wish now, what would it be? I pulled at the grass and didn't speak, for my yearnings were something I hadn't put into words, not even to her. Uh, she answered for me. Uh, you'd be a lady, Karen, sir, uh, riding in your carriage. You'd be dressed in silks and satins. And you'd have a uh, gown of bright, rich green, and there would be silver buckles on your shoes. I'd, I'd read and write, I added, turning to her eagerly. Granny, uh, will it come true? Well, she didn't answer me, and I was sad, asking myself why. If she could tell others the future, she couldn't tell me. I gazed up at her pleadingly, but she didn't seem to see me. The sun glinted on her smooth, blue-black hair, like a bug, which was braided about her head, and, and that hair should have been on Lady St. Lampson's. Oh, well, it gave Granny a proud look. Her dark eyes were alert, although she... Hadn't kept those as young as her hair. Uh, those were lines about them. Uh, what are you thinking? I asked. Oh, of the day you came. Remember? I laid my head against her thigh. I was remembering. Our first years, Joe's and mine, were spent by the sea. Our father had a little cottage uh, on the quay, which was rather like one where we lived with Granny, except that ours had a big cellar underneath where we stored and salted the pilchards after a heavy catch. Oh, when I think of that cottage, I think of the smell of Fish, all the good smell, which meant that the cellar was well stocked. It could be, it could be sure of enough to eat for a few weeks. Uh, and I always looked after Joe because our mother had died when he was four, and I was six, and she told me to always look after my little brother. Sometimes, when our father was out in the boat and the gales blew, we used to think our cottage could be swept into the sea. And then when I would cuddle Joe and sing to him, sing to him and stop him from being frightened, I, I used to pretend I wasn't frightened and found that it was a good way not to be. Continually pretending helped me a good deal, so there wasn't much to be afraid of. The best times were when the sea was calm and the harvest time when the shoals of pilchards came to our coast. The hewers who were on the watch all along the coast would, would sight the fish and give warning. And I remember how excited everyone was uh, when the cry of hua went up, for hua means in Cornish, a school of fish. So when the boats would go out and catch, uh, would all come in, our cellars would be full. And in the church, there'd be pilchards among the sheaves of wheat and the fruit and vegetables to show God that the fishermen were as grateful as the farmers. Joe and I uh, would work together in the cellar, uh, putting one layer of salt between each layer of fish until I thought my hands would never be warm again or free from the smell of pilchards. Uh, But those were the good times, and there came that winter when there was no more fish in our cellars, and the gales were worse than they had been for, oh, 80 years. Joe and I, with the other children, used to go down to the beaches at night to twitch the sand eels out of the sand with our small iron crooks, and we'd bring them home and cook them. Oh, we brought back limpets, too, uh, and caught snails, uh, which were made as a sort of a stew. We picked nettles and boiled them, and I can remember uh, what hunger was like in those times. We used to dream. We heard the welcome cry of, Hua, Hua, which was, was as wonderful a dream but made us more despairing than ever when we woke up. I saw a depression in my father's eyes, and I saw him looking at Joe and me. It was as though uh, he came to a decision. He said to me, eh, uh, your mother used to talk to you a lot about your granny. And I nodded. I had always loved or never forgotten the stories of Granny B, who lived at a place called St. Larnston. I, I reckon uh, she'd like to have a look at you, a uh, little Joe. I did not realize the significance of these words until he took out the boat. He, having lived his life on the sea, was well aware of what was threatening. I remember uh, him coming into the cottage and shouting to me, uh, Them back, he said. It'll be pilchards for breakfast. Take care of Joe till I come back. I watched him go. 
I saw the others on the beach, and they were talking to him, and I knew what they were saying, but um, but he didn't listen. Uh, I hate the southwest wind. Whenever it blows, I hear it as it blew that night. I put Joe to bed, but I didn't go myself. I just sat up, saying, Pilchards for breakfast, and yeah, listening to the wind. He never came back, and we were alone. And I didn't know what to do, but I still had to pretend for Joe's sake. Whenever I heard to think what I could do, I, I kept hearing my mother's voice telling me to look after my brother, and then my father saying, uh, take care of Joe till I come back. Uh, the neighbors helped us for a while, but those are bad times. And there was talk of putting us into workhouse. And then I remember uh, what my father said about Granny. And I told Joe that we were going to go find her. So Joe and I set out for St. Lamston. And in that time, uh, after some hardship, we came to Granny B. Another thing uh, I shall never forget uh, was the first night in Granny B's cottage. Hey, Joe was wrapped in a blanket, given hot milk to drink. And Granny B uh, made me lie down while she bathe my feet and point ointment on my sore places. Oh, afterwards, I believe that my wounds were miraculously healed by the morning, uh, but that couldn't have been true. The feeling of uh, deep satisfaction and content comes back to me now, and I felt that I had come home, that uh, Granny B was dearer to me than anyone I had ever known. I love Joe, of course, but never in my life have I known anyone so wonderful as Granny B. Oh, I remember lying on the bed while she took down her marvelous black hair and, and combed it and rubbed it, for even the unexpected arrival of two grandchildren could not interfere with that ritual. Granny B healed me, fed me, clothed me, and she gave me my dignity, my pride. The girl I was uh, at the time when I stood in the hollow wall was not the same who had come exhausted to her door. Oh, yeah, she knew this because she knew everything. We adjusted ourselves to our new life quickly, as children do. Our home was now in a mining community instead of a fishing one. Uh, for although the St. Larnston uh, mine was closed, the Fedler mine provided work uh, for many in St. Lamston people who walked two miles or so each day uh, to and from their work. I discovered that miners were superstitious as fishermen had been, for each calling was dangerous enough that those who followed it uh, wished to please the gods of chance. Granny B would sit for hours telling me stories of the mines, and my grandfather had been a miner. She told me how a, uh, did John, did John? Uh, that seems like that might be another screw up in the book. Uh, had to be left to placate the evil spirits. I don't know, maybe it's, a, it's let's look it up. Let's see if Dijon's an actual real word or if the book's just screwed up. No Wikipedia for it. No translation. Okay, so it's a screw-up in the book. Had to be left to placate the evil spirits, and that meant a good part of a hungry man's lunch. Oh, he spoke angrily to the system of paying tribute instead of wages, which meant that if a man had a bad day and his output was small, his pay was correspondingly so. She was equally indignant about those mines, which had their own Tommy shops, in which a miner must buy all the goods, uh, sometimes at high prices when I listened to Granny, but I could imagine myself descending the mine shaft. I could see the men in their red stained ragged clothes. Oh, oh, in their tin helmets, to which a candle was stuck by a sticky clay. I was conscious of dropping down to darkness in the cage, uh, and I could feel the hot air and the tremor of rock as, as men worked. I could feel the terror suddenly coming face to face with the spirit who had no Dijan. I guess Dijan's a real thing. This is the second time I'm seeing it. All right. Or a black dog or a white hare, whose appearance meant imminent danger in the mine. I said to her now, uh, I'm remembering. What brought you to me? She asked. Chance? Uh, she shook her head. Oh, it's a long way for little ones to come. Uh, but you didn't doubt that you'd find your granny, did you? You knew if you went on walking far enough, you'd come to her. Uh, didn't ye now? I nodded. Yeah, she was smiling, as though she had answered my question. I'm thinking. Thirsty, lovey, she said. Uh, Give me a thimble full of my slow gin. I went into the cottage. Damn, there's only one room in Granny B's cottage, although a storehouse had been built on it, and uh, was uh, in this that she brewed her concoctions that she often received from clients. The room was our bedroom and living room. Oh, there was a story about it, but it had been built by Pedro Balincio, Granny B's husband, uh, who is called Pedro B., uh, because the Cornish people couldn't pronounce his name and weren't going to try. So Granny uh, told me how it had been put up in the night in a fit of custom, which uh, if anyone could build a cottage in a night, they could claim the ground on which it was built. So Pedro B. had found his ground and clearing of the, of the copse uh, had hidden in the trees and the thatch of the poles, together with clay, which they would 
make cob walls, uh, and one moonlit night with his friends to help him had built the katash. All he had to do the first night was make the four walls and the roof, and gradually he would uh, put in a window, a uh, door, uh, or uh, a, a chimney. But Pedro B. had built what he could call a cottage in a night and satisfied the old custom. Pedro had come back from Spain. Uh, perhaps he had heard, according to legend, the Cornish had a streak of the Spaniard in them because so many Spanish sailors had raided the coast and ravished the women. That's a gross angle to take on that. Or having been wrecked on the rocks, had been befriended and settled down. That's true that although so many have the uh, the hair, the color of Meliora Martins, uh, there are as many again with the coal black hair and the flashing dark eyes. Oh, oh, and the quick temper to go with them, which is different from the easy going nature that seems to suit our sleepy climate. Pedro loved Granny, who is named Ker Karensa. Uh, as I was. Uh, you know, he loved her black hair and her eyes, which reminded him of uh, Spain. And they married and lived in a cottage, which they had made uh, in a night and in a day, and, and one daughter, uh, who was my mother. Into that cottage, I went to get in the slow gin. I had to pass through it uh, to reach the storehouse uh, where her brews were kept. Although we had only one room, we also had the Talfet, which was the any shelf about halfway up the wall, which uh, protruded from the room. It served as a bedroom, mine and Joe's. And we reached it by means of the ladder, uh, which had kept in the corner of the room. Joe was up there now. Oh, yeah. What are, you, what are you doing? I called. He didn't answer me. The first time when I repeated the question, uh, he, he held up a pigeon. I, I broke his leg, he told me, but uh, it will mend in a day or so. Oh, the pigeon remained still in his hands, and I saw that he had constructed a sort of splint uh, to which he had bound the leg. What uh, surprised me so much about Joe was not that he could do these things for birds and animals, but that, burp, they remained so passive while he did them. I had seen a wild cat come to him and rub her body against his leg, even before she knew he was going to feed her. Oh, he, he never ate all his meals, but kept some back to carry about him, for he was certain to find some creature who needed it more than he did. He spent all his time in the woods, and I had come upon the landing on his stomach, watching insects and grass. Oh, besides his long, slender fingers, gross, that were amazingly clever at mending the broken limbs of birds and animals, what, like little spider's legs, his fingers are long, slender spider's legs, just touching, probing, and just being disgusting. He had an extra sense where animals were concerned. Oh, he would cure their sickness with granny's herbs. And if any of the charges needed something that would help himself from her store, as though the needs of animals were more important than anything else, oh, his, his gift for curing was part of my dream. I saw him in a, in a fine house like Dr. Hilliard's, for doctors in St. Lampston were respected. And if people thought more highly of Granny B's remedies, oh, they couldn't bob a curtsy or uh, put a forelock to her in spite of her wisdom. She lived in a one-roomed cottage, where, as Dr. Hillard was gentry, I was determined to raise Joe up with me, and I wanted the rank of doctor for him almost as passionately as I wanted that of a lady for myself. Uh, and when's it mended? I asked. Well, uh, they'll fly away and feed themselves. Uh, what do you get for your pains? Well, he didn't take any notice. He was murmuring to his pigeon. Uh, if he hadn't heard me, uh, he would have wrinkled his brow, wondering uh, what he should get beyond the joy of having uh, made a maimed creature whole. The storehouse had always excited me, because I had never seen anything like it before. There were benches on each side. Uh, they were laden with pots and bottles. And there was a beam across the ceiling, and attached to this were different kinds of herbs which had been hung up to dry. And I stood still for a second or so, sniffing that odor which had never smelt anywhere else. Oh, there was a fireplace and a huge blackened cauldron uh, and benches uh, beneath that were jars of Granny's brews. And I knew the one containing slow gin, and I poured some into a glass and carried it back through the cottage out to her. I sat down beside her while she sipped. Uh, uh, granny, I said, tell me if I ever get what I want. 
She turned to me, smiling. Why, lovely, she said. You talk like one of those girls who come to me to ask if their lovers, lovers will be true. And I don't expect it, uh, of you, uh, Car- Karensa. I hate her name. I want to say Karensa. It might be Karensa. It's Karen with an S-A at the end, but... Karensa, I'm going with Karensa. Uh, but I want to know. Then listen to me. The answer is simple. Clever ones don't want the futures told. They make it. We could hear the shots all through the day. It was meant that there was a house party at the Abbas. Uh, We had seen the carriages arriving, and uh, we knew what it was, because it happened at the same time every year. Oh, they were were shooting pheasants uh, in the woods, and Joe was up at the Talfat with the dog, and he had found a week before uh, when it was starving and just beginning to be strong enough to run about, but it never left Joe's sight. He shared his food with it, and... It had kept him happy since he had found it. Oh, but now he was restless. I remembered how he had been the year before, and I knew uh, that he was thinking of the poor frightened birds fluttering up before falling down to the ground. Uh, He had banged his fist on the table when he had uh, talked of it and said, It's it's, uh, it's the wounded ones I be thinking of. Uh, If them dead, uh, there's nothing we can do, but it's the wounded ones. Oh, they don't always find them, man. Dot, dot, dot. I said, Joe, uh, you got to be sensible. Don't don't do no good worrying about what can't be helped. Oh, he agreed, but he didn't want to go out. He just stayed on the Talfat with his dog, whom he called Squab, because uh, he found it the day the pigeon, uh, whose leg uh, he had mended, flew away and took it to the place of the bird. Oh, he worried me because he looked so angry, and I was beginning to recognize in Joe something of myself. Therefore, I was never sure what he could do. I told him often that he was lucky to be able to roam about looking for sick animals. Uh, Most boys his age were working the fetter mine. People couldn't think why he wasn't sent out to work there, but oh, oh, I knew Granny shared my ambitions for him, for us both. And while there was enough uh, for us to eat, we had our freedom. It was her way of showing them that there was something special about us. Granny knew I was worried, Uh, so she said I was to go into the woods with her to gather herbs. I was glad to get away from the cottage. Granny said, "Uh, you mustn't fret yourself, girl. Uh, It's this way, and it'll always grieve when animals suffer. Oh, Granny, I wish. Oh, I wish uh, he could be a doctor to look after people. Would it cost a lot of money eh, to make him a doctor? What do you think? It's what he'd want, my dear. Oh, he wants to cure everything. Why not people? Oh, he'd get money for it, and people would respect him. Well, perhaps he doesn't care what people think like you do, Karen, sir. Uh, he's got to care, I said. Well, he will if he meant. Oh, two said nothing was meant. Uh, you said people make their own future. Uh, each makes his own lovey. Tis for him to make that he will. Uh, same as tis for you, too. Well, he lies there on the towel fat most of the day uh, uh, with his animals. Uh, leave me, lovey, said Granny. Uh, he'll make his own life the way he wants. But I wasn't going to leave him be. I was going to make him understand how he had to break out of this life into which he had been born, and we were too good for it. All of us, Granny, Joe, and me, I wonder why Granny hadn't seen it, how she could be content to live her life as she had. Uh, uh, Gathering herbs always uh, soothed me. Hmm. Granny would explain that there had to go and find what she wanted, and then she would tell me about the healing properties of each one. But on that day, as we picked... Every now and then I would hear the distant sounds of guns. When we were tired, she said she would sit down under the trees, and I persuaded her to talk of the past. When Granny talked, she seemed to put a spell on me, so that uh, I felt that I was there as it was all happening. I even felt that I was Granny herself being wooed by Pedro B., the young miner who was different from all the others. Oh, he used to sing lovely songs to her, which she didn't understand because they were in Spanish. Oh, but taint always necessary to hear the words to know, she told me. Oh, 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 he were not so much liked in these parts. Uh, being foreigner and all, uh, he wasn't to work for a Cornishman, as uh, some of them did say, let alone foreigners coming to take the mansions out of their mouths. But my Pedro, oh, he laughed at him. Oh, he, he said uh, once that he'd, when he had seen that I was enough. He was going to stay. 
and where I be, uh, that where he belonged to be. Oh, Granny, you loved him, truly you loved him. Oh, he was a man for me, and I wanted no other, nor ever have. I said, Do you, have you ever had another lover? Granny's face was set in expression that I had never seen before. Oh, she had turned her head slightly in the direction of the abbess, and seemed as though she were actually listening for the guns. Oh, your grandfather was not a mild man, she said. Oh, he'd have killed one who wronged him as life uh, as look it un. I hate this. That were a man er were. I hate this. Uh, did he ever kill anyone, Granny? Oh, no, but he might have. He would have if he'd known. Known what, Granny? Nah, she didn't answer. Oh, but her face was like the mask that she put on so that no one could see what's beneath. Oh, I lay against her, looking at the trees. The firs would stay green all through the winter, but the leaves on the others were already russet brown. The cold weather would soon be with us. Granny said after a long pause, eh, that it was so long ago... Uh, that you had another lover? Oh, he weren't no other lover, I tell ye. Uh, perhaps I tell ye uh, for a warning. Tis well to know the way the world wags for others. For maybe it'll wag that way for you. Eh? Eh? Yeah, but this other one were Justin St. Lamston. Not uh, this Justin, uh, his father. I sat bolt upright, my eyes wide. A, a granny and... Sir Justin St. Lamston? Oh, tis one's father. There wasn't much difference in them. He was a, a wicked one. Then why, for Pedro's sake? But tis like you to come to a judgment afore you've heard the facts, child. Now I've started, and I must go and tell you all. He spoke me and fancied me. Oh, I was a St. Lamston girl <laughs> as I bespoke. But he must have made inquiries and found that I was to marry Pedro. I remember how he cornered me. Oh, there's a little walled, oh, little walled garden close to the house. Well, that's a good place to stop. Uh, why don't we uh, wrap this up and go down to the smoking room where we can uh, review what the hell we just read. Oh, look, you finally made it down. Uh Good. Why don't you get yourself all settled in and enjoy a cigarette while we sit here amongst the parakeets my wife put in cages here in my smoking room. Yep, they're all going to die of tiny, adorable bird lung cancer. But my wife doesn't care, uh, so I guess I shouldn't care either. Uh, they all cry out for help all the time, constantly suffering, but uh, yeah, we just ignore it. Um, in either case, uh, uh, what happened in this book? Well... Uh, there's a castle uh, with a, a dead nun or some woman buried in one of the walls. Because the she starts out in the beginning of the story saying about how the walls of these castles are so strong and so sturdy and so old. But uh, also one wall just crumbles, so there goes that theory. Uh, and then there's a dead person behind the wall. Okay, calm down. There's a dead person behind the wall. Uh, and so... Oh, everyone's talking about it. There's already stones up there that they think is like represents the seven virgins. That's kind of like an old uh, thing from England. I've read stories with theories about how you see a bunch of stones kind of put in a circle, which is probably just bored villagers just in general. Hey, look at these long stones. They kind of look like people because they're tall and skinny. Why don't we just kind of put them in a circle? Wouldn't that be cool? But then, you know, a hundred years later, people are like, oh, that's a group of people that got turned to stone because they were trying to, like, I don't know, fight a witch or they were a bunch of virgins. So anyways, in this case, same idea. But now, oh, God, they found a they found a dead person buried in the walls, which apparently in England is good luck, which is the most insane thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, and so I, I don't know how to reflect on that. It's just bad. Oh, there's a person whose throat was slashed and they were uh, ground into meat while they were still half living. Uh, that's good luck. Same idea. He got walled up and starved to death. Uh, oh, what good luck. So, that's weird. Uh, on top of that, um, this girl wants to go see it. No one's really around. The wall is still under construction, so she crawls in and just wants to stand there. I just want to see what it's like to be a dying person. Which, uh, 
I, I don't know. That's a human thing to do, I guess. Not the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. Eh, it's fine. But then, what's not fine is a bunch of rich kids. A bunch of rich kids show up and start making fun of her. Because the rich kids also want to see the spot where the woman is walled up. And they're like, oh, hey, hey, there's somebody in there. And they're all freaking out. And they're like, oh, it's this idiot. This uh, poor idiot. And so they all make fun of her. And so she kind of she finally gets out of there and runs back to her grandma. Uh, her grandma's name is Granny B, B with two E's, and uh, that's a little unnerving because before my mom died, uh, she always wanted to call herself Granny B because of the, her last name uh, being the first letter. And uh, so I keep reading Granny B, and I'm like, you better not deface my mom's good name. So I hope this story doesn't make my mom look bad with the same nickname that she gave herself as a grandmother, but we'll find out. Uh, yeah, we'll find out how this story's gonna go. Uh, it's a gothic romance, so God knows what's gonna happen. Um, and then after that, she just kind of talks about her husband, a Spaniard, and uh, apparently Spain came and raped a bunch of people and there's a bunch of kids walking around they were half Spanish and uh, that's a little weird when you think about it, how they have the traits of the rapists in their hair and their eyes, so that's a little weird uh, but you know, history history comes alive so, um, and then that's uh, pretty much kind of it, she's got a brother she cares about makes him, a, he wants to be a, uh, a doctor and, uh, and then it's just about like, you know, what was grandpa like, did he to kill anybody and like eh, no so uh there you go yeah, it's the beginning of the story i had to just kind of make this up as i went along there are no chapters so i decided can i read 100 pages no uh it would have been like a three hour long show so i'm doing 30 pages for the whole episode that was 30 pages we just read is there a chapter end marker nope i just had to stop where it felt good so with that uh ah, the way you keep sneaking into my house uninvited. I'm sure you'll be back next week, and uh, when you are, I will be ready to meet more, uh, uh, read more of this crap to you. So, uh, thanks for listening, and I will see you then. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the Part of the podcast I hate the most, where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, nah, there's there's that. Uh, uh, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business, to begin with, just to meet cool people, not losers. So if you're cool... Uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com, which uh, just points you to my link tree. Everything's on the link tree. Just go to the link tree if you want to see where I am. And of course, uh, link tree has the dumbest URL in the world. L-I-N-K dot, no wait, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash nuzzlehouse it's the dumbest thing if you go to nuzzlehouse.com it's just gonna reroute you over there after giving you some weird error about it not being secure i hate it i hate the internet but uh if you go there you get to hear some of the other stuff that uh i and my wife work on like uh the radio mystery theater show where we try to recreate uh the same show that used to be on in the 70s but they don't make any episodes anymore so we make our own and we just steal all their commercials uh, and also, just in curious mind, uh, we made a Christmas album. If you go to our link tree, you can see that we made a Christmas album. It's the first thing we did after getting married, which I think everyone should do when they get married, is start talking about the Christmas album they're going to make. And we're working on a new show where we give relationship advice by reading a Paranormal Smut. And since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com but don't, uh, don't email if you're a nerdling or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's gotta be one left. 